Welcome to Learning Photography with Duck. Here's your host, Duck. Okie doke. We are here. Uh, as always, I am your host, Duck, and this is uh, Learn Photography with Duck. And today we have uh, photography Q&A where I will hopefully answer whatever questions you may have on any topic regarding photography, whether it's about gear, about lighting, about, you know, editing, about working with models uh you know maybe business questions whatever it is uh let's get into it um i don't have i don't have a topic of discussion to begin with um i was going to touch a little bit on on the ai fiasco um with you know the the uh, what's being termed the adobe blunder of the century <laughs> for those who who use adobe products and uh adobe step forward in the ai industry you know which i kind of covered last week uh some of you you know probably could care less because it doesn't apply to you uh but those of us who utilize it for work and um you know have have a or want to have a say in where this new ai or i should say the generative image ai is going um adobe's adobe's dropping the ball all right but i don't want to rehash it because i covered it last week and i'm sure it really doesn't apply to you guys um but unfortunately it's becoming a little bit more and more prevalent where we are using ai in our everyday work um there's chat gpt which you know i'll be honest i use uh, i use because it's a great tool to start generating ideas it's a terrible tool for giving you a finished product and I think that's what a lot of people are are having a hard time, you know, differentiating. Yeah, you know, they say, oh, uh, well, and and to be honest, there's a lot of here. Let me. Uh, uh, there's there's a lot of fluff out on the internet about how to use these tools to make publish a book in in five minutes with AI, and it's just. What's being kicked out is garbage and people can see that it's garbage. So they're really doing no, no, uh, there's no benefit to the person who's, who's doing that, using it as a shortcut. But I use AI as a tool to generate ideas, uh, you know, and for that, it's pretty good to a limit. All right. So anyway, what I want to do is uh, before I go even further, I just want to mention what's coming up uh, this weekend. For those of you who haven't signed up yet, I am doing the multiplicity photo shoot. And I know Alan, you Alan with an E, not Alan with an A. I saw you uh, signed up for that. So looking forward to it. Um, uh, it's a multiplicity photo shoot. I do it every year. I think I only missed one year and that was, you know, during the, the, uh, the height of the COVID. Um, but it, it tends to be a lot of fun for all the participants. And the premise is that you are in charge of creating a scene that you populate it with yourself. So you'll be working with a partner. Your partner uses your camera so that way you go home with images on your camera of yourself because you are going to be in front of the camera acting out the different roles of the scene that you are creating. All right, so it's coming up for the weekend, Alan. So try to come up with a theme for your, for your little scene that you want to create. It doesn't have to be complicated. You just think in terms of you know, having people interact with each other, but you're going to be the person that is going to play the role of all the people. 
So they could be playing, you know, catch, maybe with a beach ball, while somebody's casually reading a book, uh, and somebody else is maybe taking a picture of the people playing, you know, catch, uh, and you know, you you get the picture. All right. Um, so think about how are these different people going to look? Do you know? Should you bring a change of, of outfits? I usually bring like a change of, of shirts because it's very easy. I'll keep on the same pants. I'll just switch out the shirts. Super easy. That way people see that there's a difference. It doesn't have to be that way. You can play all the roles all the same because that in itself is quite unique as well. Uh, because it just plays on the fact that it's a multiplicity photo shoot. Okay. And... Uh, you're not limited to the number of people that you can have populating your scene. You can have as many as you want, okay? You can have, if if you can finagle it, you can have a hundred yous in your scene, uh, creating a massive crowd, okay? Which I think that would be pretty cool. Maybe have have two central figures that are, are pugilists, and then you have a... a half ring of of spectators all cheering on and placing bets and doing all kinds of things all right so that'd be kind of funny uh, but anyway that's coming up on saturday um and we're going to be at uh booth memorial park in stratford it's a quaint little park um there's there's two entrances uh and there are two parking lots uh at booth memorial one is a very small lot, um, and you'll see it kind of nestled in with the uh, the the main buildings uh, on the property. And if you go a little bit further, there's an entryway to the back lot, uh, which also leads down to a smaller lot all the way in the back where there is a little uh, um, children's playscape, all right? Um, if you want park in the small lot, we'll be right off of that small lot for the most part. So, uh, it makes it convenient because it keeps the car close to you. And that area tends to be a little bit more shaded than the back parking lot as well. But we'll be traveling throughout the, the property. Uh, but it's just, you know, for convenience sake, it's usually easier to, uh, get, to your car from that front lot, all right? So anyway, that starts at 10 o'clock in the morning, and we're gonna go until whoever, you know, uh, um, decides to call it quit last. <laughs> all right, uh, on Sunday, it's, it's not listed here, but on Sunday, Milford Photo is hosting a Yale photo walk uh, on the Yale property. Uh, and unfortunately, Jesse can't do it this year. He Something else came up, so he asked me to pinch hit for him. So I will be substituting for Jesse for the Yale Photo Walk. Uh, you do have to sign up through um, uh, Milford Photos Meetup Group. And I think there's a charge like $10 because uh, in order to get into the quad areas of Yale, we need to hire um, a, a, uh, a guide or two. And I think, I think they're hiring two guides who are going to facilitate our tour of the Yale property uh, and get us into areas that would otherwise be locked behind gates. So if you are into architecture photography, if you are into street photography, um, this is a great opportunity to, you know, see some of the hidden areas of the campus that you normally wouldn't see. Uh, so anyway, sign up through meetup.com, Milford Photo, and that's going to be on Sunday. And I believe the start time is also 10 o'clock in the morning. Okay. Uh, and then for those of you who are interested in any kind of portraiture photography uh, or are thinking of possibly, you know, um, consider using your camera to make a little extra cash on photographing people. Uh, we, uh, the CTPPA is doing, is hosting a dynamic senior experience 
a full day workshop on Friday, June 29th, and that's from 9 a.m. to 4 p.m. Uh, and it's it's featuring um, two photographers, Nathan Locker and Josh Hanna, uh, who are um, going to be uh, um, walking through their entire senior photography workflow. All right, everything from how to set up your camera, how to set up your lights, how to shoot the the seniors. We're going to have some models for demonstration purposes. They ask that you bring your camera so you can uh, take some snaps yourself and get a feel for what it's like. Uh, then they're going to walk you through the whole editing process and even discuss some of the business of running a uh, senior portrait business. Now, even though these guys are, are gearing their presentation around senior portraits, you know, senior student portraits, you can apply that to other types of portraiture. It doesn't have to be just, you know, seniors. It could be children. It could be family. It could be headshots. It could be, you know, maybe you just don't want to do the business part, but you're looking for something creative to do with people photography for yourself. Uh, they got a lot of great ideas. If you haven't seen their work, it's phenomenal. Uh, they tend to be a little bit on the darker side. They like those deep shadows and and uh, um, bright spots of highlight, which is something that appeals to me that, unfortunately, I don't do because my business clients don't want that kind of work. So uh, I'm looking forward to it uh, just to break out of the box, as they say, and, and break away from what I normally do. So anyway, that's uh, coming up in a couple weeks on uh, Friday. It is a full day, so just keep that, uh, be aware of that. To register for that, you have to go to ctppa.com and uh, you'll see the, the listing there. Just click on it, Dynamic Senior uh, Experience. Uh, it is $200, but you are getting a full day's experience with two really talented professional photographers who are award winners in their own right. So anyway, all right, that's uh, that's enough for that. Okay. Um, like I said, I really don't want to beat a dead horse uh, on the AI conversation, um, you know, and who knows, it's it's developing. But I did notice one thing um, that that if you use Photoshop uh, and you use any of the AI tools in Photoshop, uh, recently Instagram made a change to their the the way uh, images are brought in and processed. Uh, apparently. Uh, a lot of software that has AI capabilities are tagging images with a tag saying that AI was used here. And uh, what happens is now Instagram will flag and tag with a very noticeable uh, AI image or, or yeah, uh, AI image uh, in the corner all right. And it's getting a lot of people upset because maybe they're not. Well, the, the ones that are getting upset, it's because they're not using they're not doing generative AI. They're just using some AI tools in the editing process. And those tools can be either, you know, uh, expanding the background using the the AI, um, because we, as you understand, Firefly is now embedded into Photoshop uh, as one of the tools. You can generate image in your photograph. So if you use any part of that tool, whether it's to clone out, uh, uh, no, I'm sorry, if it's to uh, um, AI remove some form of, of, of uh, element from your image, or you're adding an AI element to your image, whether it's you know um, a house on a field uh, that you took, 
or you're just expanding the canvas with the AI, it's going to mark the file as having used artificial intelligence uh, uh, imagery. And now what happens is Instagram is flagging anything and everything that has that tag, regardless of the percentage of AI that was used. So what's happening is people who may use a little bit, little bit of AI in their image are getting flagged as, oh, this is an AI image. And people are wrongly assuming that the entire image is AI when it really isn't. Okay. Now Doug, this. Yeah. Uh, Doug, by any chance, you mentioned uh, it was Photoshop. Is that the same results with uh, um, Lightroom? If you take something from Lightroom and transfer it? I have not seen that yet. Uh, it's it's basically Photoshop that is the culprit from what I understand. Uh, so but if you change things with, with uh, Lightroom, that would not be considered AI. Uh, no, because I, I think I think the AI remove is slightly different okay. uh, in, in Photoshop than it is in Lightroom. All right. That's not to say that it's not coming down the pipeline and it's not to say that I am wrong. I'm not, right. you know, that, that I might be wrong. Uh, because this is a new development. I haven't really looked into it. I'm just kind of passing this on. This I, I just learned about this like two days ago, all right, where Instagram is is currently the, the, the only culprit. But I have a feeling uh, that this is going to be coming down to pipeline, you know, because Meta owns Facebook and Instagram, I won't be surprised if we start seeing some of this in Facebook, all right? Because unfortunately, Facebook is notorious for showcasing fake photos, AI generating photos from these accounts that are calling them legitimate photographs, you know? Uh, and uh, unfor you know, unfortunately for them, fortunately for us, the community is quick to call them out uh, I don't know if you noticed the, lately the 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 uh, recent one was the bald eagle with the two baby bald eagles who had white heads. I don't know if you saw that one yet. All right, uh, 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 Alan, uh, you're a big uh, wildlife photographer. I don't know if that's come across your feed yet. Okay. No, not yet, not yet. I thought it was hilarious. It has a a, a full grown eagle on a nest and in the nest are two baby eagles and they have full head of white white feathers <laughs> it's the most bizarre looking image ever and anybody who has a brain cell in their head called it out for ai but yet there were a ton of people that, oh how cute oh where did you take this photo and I'm like thinking to myself, where has critical thinking gone? It's it's it poof, you know. So uh, uh, another one that just came across that I, I noticed yesterday uh, uh, was it yes yeah yesterday was this hummingbird uh, orchid um, mix. All right. It was a hummingbird and the wings. That, that one I've, yeah, that one I've seen. You saw, I saw that, that one. one. Okay. Yeah. Uh, you, you open up the comments and it's like, cool. Wow. Beautiful. What kind of bird is that? Where did you take this? And I'm thinking to myself, seriously, seriously, people, where, where in your mental faculties did school fail you where you see a, a very obvious hybrid combination of a flower and a bird and you think that's a real live creature? Oh, I don't get it. I don't get it. But uh, the, the problem is, all right, AI is here. Okay, but I am noticing 
uh, there's a trend where people are starting to get um, sick and tired of these generative AIs because they've they've over flooded, you know, social media. Uh, Mid Journey obviously, you know, has has trained itself on models, and uh, once the models uh, start generating images, it uses everything that gets exported. It uses that content to train itself as well. So it's constantly training itself. And if you've seen images by Mid Journey, you've noticed that they have gotten a lot better. All right, that whole fallacy of of you know, really wanky fingers is starting to to really disappear. All right. But we're still in that little bit of an uncanny valley when it comes to the human figure. Faces, hands, it still has a hard time. You know, uh, you look at a photo and all of a sudden you notice that, hey, that that little figure that's like in the background has three legs. <laughs> but yet. People say, ooh, beautiful photo. <laughs> I don't get it. Um, so anyway, uh, like I was starting to mention earlier, you know, one of the problems is that people are using this AI technology to shortcut the whole creative process and are relying on AI to give them a finished product. And of course, we saw this in the commercial world. Uh, I've noticed there have been a couple of, of actual commercials on TV that are, you look at them, they're very distinctly AI generated, all right? Uh, I only noticed one instance of that, but I'm sure we're going to start seeing some more of that. But what I'm also hearing from, because because uh, uh, because I deal with businesses uh, as a service, uh, I tend to keep track of what some of the business trends are, and uh, I like to occasionally check out what the stats are. And what I'm finding is that the uh, commercial environment is starting to push back on these agencies and these people who are trying to use AI as a finished product. They're, they're not having it, okay? Um, one of the things that was uh, touted not too long ago was, hey, you need a new headshot? Let our AI generator generate your new headshot. Why do you need to get all dressed up and made up and hire a photographer when you can use AI to create your headshot? All you got to do is plug in a couple of your photos. You can tell, take them with your cell phone and it will train our AI to generate a new headshot. Scary, but what's happening is that what's being generated isn't quite there. It's still in that uncanny valley, all right. And if if you know what the uncanny valley is, is where you know uh, uh, the uncanny valley. If if you don't understand it, is uh, uh, it was a thing where um, in relation to androids and humanoid robots. Of course, in the beginning, they look very robotic. You look at them, it's, a, it's distinctly a robot, okay? And then the robots start getting more human-like features. Think C-3PO, all right? But you look at C-3PO, it has a humanoid shape, but it's very distinctly a robot, all right? But now we get into these, these robots that have these latex humanoid fat masks that are supposed to replicate, you know, a real human. But yet you look at them, it's like, uh, the eyes don't move like a human. They're like, you know, uh, there's a blankness to their stare. 
uh, there's no muscle structure, so the the the, the mouths look like this when they ever they speak, and it's always that thing. They look like like a, a animatronic from Disney. Okay, when it starts to get that more realistic look, where on first view it's a oh is 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 that a human or is that a uh, or is that a robot? All right, that little question. That's the uncanny valley where you know something's wrong, but you can't quite place it until you spend a little bit of time with it. And then you realize, oh, yeah, it's a robot. OK, that's where we are right now with generative AI. We're getting to the point where these images are looking so realistic that you have to take a deeper, closer look and then realize, oh, yeah, that's. That's not a real photograph that I'm looking at, okay? And they're trying to sell this as a service to business people. And they're realizing that, yes, okay, maybe I'll save a few pennies, all right? So instead of paying a photographer, they're paying some software service to replicate their image and they'll post it on their website People will see the image on their website and then they'll meet the person in real life and they'll go, yeah, that's not the same person. What are they trying to pull over on me? All right. If they're being that deceptive, what else are they deceptive about? And businesses are finding out very, very quickly that it's hurting their bottom line and they're stepping away from AI or, or this generative AI. So... Uh, which is good because uh, I applaud that. You know, uh, let's bring the creative back to the creators, not to some computer. Okay. But like I said, you can use a lot of these tools to improve your work, what you create with your hands. Take it to that next level by utilizing these tools. All right. So, anyway. Uh, that's my latest observation on AI. Um, I don't know if you guys are, you know, affected by any of this, you know, and, um, so anyway, we can, uh, start the discussion there, or if you have a question on anything, hit me up, feel free. Anything? Um, I, I do have a, a couple of questions, but it, it may not pertain to, but here's the only problem I'm having right now with uh, I'm trying to download some photos on um, Lightroom or uh, uh, Lightroom Classic okay. on two different computers. They're not downloading now. I, I'm having trouble with uh, you know, Adobe entirely uh, for last week. I don't know if anybody else has had that kind of problem. Are you having trouble with Adobe? Anybody else? Uh, no, I haven't noticed anything. All right. Now, what do you mean by downloading? Uh, um, off of my, uh, uh camera card. You know, um, no, no oh, problem. I yeah. see. Im so importing into, in into right. Photoshop? Right. Or, uh, Photoshop. I mean, uh, uh, into, into Lightroom? Uh, Lightroom, yes. Okay. With two different computers. Same problem. Same problem, two different computers. Okay. Uh, one laptop and one PC. All right. Um, have you done any kind of testing to try to isolate what the problem might be? I haven't had the time as of yet. I mean, it was okay. this. I came home late yesterday. I toyed with it a little bit yesterday, a little bit today, and here. How many? How many times have you reused that card? Uh, don't know. <laughs> oh but my god i have it, cards that are you know many years old I, I, yeah I I, 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 I I do too but i also occasionally have a bad one yes yes i've uh, had a, a well we'll say if i had a in my camera when i have a card in my camera i could see i could see all the shots i take it right would that make a difference i mean okay. if it's there in the um, camera well <clears throat> fortunately you know, uh, the failure of a card is nowadays, it's very rare. All right. Mm -hmm. um, it does happen. So Alan's correct. 
there yeah. could be some some flaw with the card all right? right so there's a couple of things that i would suggest okay and uh repeat it on uh both machines so that way you can you can test both machines under the same conditions and try to narrow down where the problem might be okay so the first thing i i would suggest is uh don't open Lightroom. Just plug in your card and see if you can transfer the files from your card to your machine into a folder. Okay? If you're having problems doing that, then it's an it's either a card problem, a card reader problem, or a computer problem, not necessarily a Lightroom problem, all right? Because what we've done is we've removed Lightroom out of the equation, okay? And then do it on both machines and see if, if they compare. If everything transfers easily, quickly, without much mishap, then you know that your reader's okay, possibly your card is okay okay uh and that your computer's uh processing the files properly okay and that point then we can say okay yes it might be in lightroom okay so I'm that that will now set us up for uh the second part of the test okay because if you've been importing uh, images into Lightroom straight from your card reader, okay? What we're now doing is because you went from the card reader to the computer, we're now going to go to computer into Lightroom, okay? Mm -hmm. So at this point, launch Lightroom, find the folder that you downloaded on the images onto your computer with, and do a, a add or move function rather than you know through the import okay uh i would say do an add first so if you can uh in the step one uh take the the images off your card put them into a folder into where you normally store your images so that the folder is in the same structure as all your other images all right you follow that yeah. Okay. Oh, very well. Yeah. Yes. No, that's, right. a, that's a that's a great way to start. Yep. Yes. So now launch Lightroom. All right. The file's already where it needs to be. All right. They just need to be brought into the library. So you launch Lightroom, you go import, and then you go add. All right. So along the top, it'll say, uh, actually, why I got friggin' Lightroom right here. Let me switch this over. I'm such an idiot. All right. All right. Here we go. Share. Okay. Import. All right. Right up here, uh, you're going to see uh, normally it'll, it'll be copy as DNG or copy. So what that does, it'll take and make a copy off your camera card onto your system. You've already done that separate of Lightroom. So now what you're going to do is you're going to... Uh, add okay so you just click on add until it's highlighted and then click on import and you're good to go it'll populate your your um your library all right and then watch is it creating the problem that you experienced previously or is it doing it you know uh relatively quickly okay Obviously, it's going to be dependent on the number of images you have. The more images on the card that it's, it's or the more images in that folder that it's bringing in, obviously, the longer amount of time it's going to take. Uh, but you can judge based on past experience how it's handling it. All right. Uh, if, if it's creating the same problems, then you know, well, it's got something to do with Lightroom. 
All right, and at that point, we can try to figure out what it is, okay? So uh, I would suggest you do that first and then give me your feedback because if the problem still persists, there are a few th other things that we can follow up, but I want to get there first, if that makes sense. No, it does. I mean, that's, that's actually a great idea. Put it in the folder first. And then, you know, if it downloads to the folder, it, it'll work. It'll work. Good. Okay. Very good. All right. Um, and then, uh, and then, yeah. So after, after that, then uh, I'll, I'll talk about some things that you can do to uh, your catalog um, <sighs> and other checks. All right. One check that I would also do, uh, and you can probably do right now, is in your uh actually here because i i know i have this problem okay if you go to your file ex file browser okay uh and it doesn't matter if you are on uh, mac or windows okay but if you go to your uh um your main operating uh, um, drive, your main your main drive that you're putting your images in, you can see that I am almost maxed out on mine. I gotta start moving some stuff out of that out of that drive, okay? Because that is going to slow down your system. If it's over full, uh, it's gonna slow you down, okay? Um, so you might want to check that if that's the I, case I edit, did that yeah i transferred a lot of photos to uh, um, uh, right. yeah Be, because your operating system requires a certain amount of free space in order to operate um uh, adequately so that's the other thing i i would check if i were you okay and as you saw <laughs> I got to hop on mind. <laughs> uh, so I'm, I'm, I'm redlining it. So, so do that, get back to me and then we'll take it from there. Okay. Thank you. All right. No problem. All right. Any other questions uh, anybody may have? Let's, let's talk about uh, Saturday. I, I know, uh, when you have multiple photographs, okay. Can I work? Can I work with uh, multiple uh, or uh, multiple photos or stacking? Photo stacking. Yeah. Uh, right. Actually, the, hold, the hold on one second. I got to get something uh, to drink real quick. Give me a second. Okay. A little warm in here in my throat it's starting to go a little dry all right so after you mean after you've you've taken the photos well when i'm taking photos can i use photo stacking it, so so afterwards when i'm when we're putting it all together uh would that make a difference or would in, that help or would that hinder in camera in camera yeah no that gives you a, a totally different technique um uh, when you do it in camera, it's kind of like it, it looks more like a double exposure than a photo stack uh, image. Um, unless unless you got some camera that, you know, takes parts at a time. Um, uh, I, I know, know some, Olymp I know some Olympus cell phones photo, will do it. Uh, Olympus has Olympus photo has stack it. in camera. Uh, but I don't know the breakdown of it. Well, if your camera has it and you've never used it, yeah. hey, try it. Try yeah. it out. Here's yeah. a great time to experiment. You know, um, well, isn't photo stacking for um, more for on a tripod, uh, multiple exposures of the same subject at varying distances? 
as opposed to what you're trying to do on oh, Saturday? Oh, 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 yeah. That's something that you might want to check. It, it may, uh, it may be terminology a is the same. Yeah, it may be a built-in photo focus stacking. Yeah. All right. If it's a focus stacking thing, that's totally different than what we're doing. Uh, well, could I not use that though? If if, uh, no, if I'm taking well, because what what focus stacking does is, all right. You you have um. Let me see if. Uh, hold on one second. Let me go to. Um, classroom charts. All right. Let's let's do. Let's do this. All right, desktop draw draw where's my draw okay good all right so you have oh i'm all kinds of crooked all right you have you as the photographer with your little camera right okay right. and then you have your subject and then you have you know maybe some kind of background element and then way in the background, you have, you know, the mountains and all that good stuff. Okay. Your camera, all right, has your sensor plane and your focal plane is on this the, the same parallel, just further out to where you're focusing. Okay. So the camera has a fixed focus point. And then you understand that as we get away from that focal point, it becomes blurrier, all right? And it doesn't matter if it's going to the front or to the back, we're going to encounter blur, okay? What focus stacking does is it says, okay, <clears throat> I'm going to take several photos of the same scene Okay, and like Alan said, you, you need to kind of be grounded on a tripod so that mm -hmm. the camera doesn't move, all right? So the camera takes a photo at, let's say, at this focal range right here, okay? Then it refocuses at another point, takes a picture, refocuses at another point, takes a picture, refocuses at another point, takes a picture, okay? And then it takes all those four or however many pictures and puts it together into one. And the way it does is it looks for all the in-focus parts, all right? And uh, uh, overwrites anything that might be blurry by keeping the parts that are in focus and overwriting the parts that are out of focus, okay? So what happens is you now get a focal length that or a focal range that is deeper than what your lens can actually physically do. You, did you follow that? Oh, absolutely. Okay. And I'm, I'm, so, I'm thinking I, I could use that stereo. though. I mean, if I, if I have a tripod, and I got my subject matter, and I had the background. Um, but when 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 I put when we're putting it together later on, putting all the figures together, is that where it's going to screw up? Uh, well, so so if your camera has built-in focus stacking, mm -hmm. this is all going to be done automatically by the camera, and the camera will process this for you. You don't need to do anything. All right. So when mm -hmm. you download your images, you're going to get a focus, focus stacked image. Now, mm -hmm. if you do it manually, all right, if you focus stack manually, then you will get individual photos that you now have to manipulate in Photoshop on your own. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yes. 
Okay. All right. So this is done by your camera's uh, AI. Okay. Now the problem with that and trying to do a multiplicity photo shoot is one, the camera is going to take these four individual photos fairly quickly because what it's trying to do is it's trying to minimize any movement within the frame because it's got to, you know, it's got a uh, photo shift the focus, photo shift the focus, photo shift the focus. All right. So that's going to do it very, very quickly. You're not going to have a time to reposition yourself within the scene. Okay. And secondly, the focus is going to go out of focus from where you initially focused. All right. So if you're here, all right, and you say, I'm going to move in, in that same line of focus and maybe do uh, a different pose, okay? You're, that is now gonna be out of focus because the camera's focusing here, not here, okay? And that's only if you can beat the camera to the next photo. Okay. <laughs> All right. Now, I know some cell phones do have the capability of doing a multiplicity sh uh, photo, okay? And the camera has to be stationary, but the camera tells you, because it's a program, the camera says, okay, press the button, then have the person move to the next location. So what it does is, is the, the way that works is you have your aspect ratio for your finished image, right? So here it is, you're holding your, your cell phone, you got your, your camera app open. All right. And it says, OK, position your subject in this section here. OK. And it takes a photo. All right. So what it's doing is it's exposing this area only. All right. And then the app is going to say, OK, have your subject move to the next position. All right, and then they're maybe here sitting in a chair, okay? And it takes this photo, all right? So this will be photo number one, photo number two, all right? Then the camera waits and instructs you to tell the person to, you know, move to position uh, three, and it's like, yay, jumping, all right? And it's going to take that photo, all right, and just expose that little bit. And finally, all right, tells you to uh, position your your guy, your, your subject in the last section, and it takes image number four. It combines them all and then spits out a finished product with one, two, three, four subjects, okay? or however many the program is set up for. That's how that works, all right? That's kind of, not quite, but kind of what we're going to be doing uh, manually, okay? Except we, we frame our photo, and instead of taking a photo where it's only a quadrant, it's going to take the entire image all right, with you in location one, then you take a separate image, you in location two, separate image, location three, separate image, location four, while your camera is on a tripod. Okay, so that's the, that's the difference between it. So if your camera has this capability, like the cell phone app, then yeah, you can do it. Okay, absolutely. Um, but you need to, to find that out. So read up on, uh, on your manual, see exactly what it has. Okay. Good. I love experimentation. This is great. Oh yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Now, <clears throat> if you have, uh, if your camera can do double exposures, which, can. uh, surprisingly, a lot of cameras can. Okay, mm -hmm. what it does is your camera 
uh, will be set up to capture a scene. Okay. And in this particular case, you don't need to be, there's a bug walking across my glasses here. Uh, that was very freaky. Uh, you don't need to be uh, tethered to a tripod. All right. Uh, you can take, um, you know, two different images. All right. And uh, what I found with a double exposure, what works best is taking image number one uh, that has a darker background and then image number two has a lighter background okay so for example uh you can take a picture of a person all right maybe in, in profile right nice nice close-up and then the second photo is a at the the top of a tree all right against the sky so all this now becomes very very light and it's like superimposing one image over another and what you do is you get like the this view of a tree superimposed over the uh the face of a person so what happens is the camera takes picture number one and it purposely kind of sort of underexposes it a little bit and then the camera is on hold all right you can't do anything other than to take the second photo all right and then you you kind of readjust yourself for the second photo you press the trigger again and it takes the second photo again slightly underexposed because what it's doing is it's taking the two exposures to combine it into a single exposure, all right? And it just so happens that one is a picture of a face, the other one's a picture of uh, a tree against the clouds, and you get this funky creative thing. The nice thing about it is that it is absolutely 100% experimental. Yeah. You don't know what you're gonna get until the camera displays it to you. Sometimes it's good, sometimes it's bad. You know, uh, but after working with, with it a while, you know, you get to find out some tricks. Like that's how I discovered if your first image is on the darker side and you take a second image against a very bright background, you see the effect a lot better, you know. Um, so anyway, if that's the case, uh, your instruction manual will tell you that it has that feature and uh, find out how to use it because by all means, that's another thing that you can do. You know, absolutely. Play around with it. Okay. All right. But what we are going to be doing is, is pretty much manual because most cameras can't do a multiplicity. All right. You know, yes, some cell phones can, but most cameras can't, right? Uh, and unfortunately, I don't know enough about Olympus cameras. Olympus has a lot of magic built into it. Uh, they have some real voodoo wizards working at, at their companies who are just blowing the, the technology out of the water with their cameras. So uh, I'm sure if you pull back the curtain, you'll see some... some uh, shenanigans going on there that that uh, most people don't have in their cameras so definitely check it out all right any other questions <clears throat> no questions all right this is going to be a very short ep one. short episode no i have a question where am i turned on Yep, I can hear you. Okay. When you were talking, excuse me, <clears throat> when you're talking about your uh, showing us your, you got to do some cleanup on your disk drive because you're about at 100%. Yeah. So um, when you approach that, so you've got a lot of old work that you may be cleaning out. Do you at that point say, I'm going to, 
when I clean it out, I'll have it backed up somewhere, but I'm going to take it out of my Lightroom catalog, or is there some way that things stay in your Lightroom um, catalog even when you well, the, clean up? Yeah, so the good thing with this is that um, this particular machine that I showed you, all right, so if if we look here, all right, uh you can see my os is a very small drive okay and this is just my operating system so i don't have any photos on here i don't have any documents um except for what may be on my desktop or in a desktop folder or um, and that's pretty much it. Everything else is, is, uh, uh, could be software. All right. Okay. So what I need to do is I need to go in and one of the things that I need to check is duplicates of programs. Now I understand in the past, uh, Photoshop used to, or I should say Adobe used to do duplicates uh, every time they updated Lightroom, they would install the new version, but keep the old version still installed. All right. I believe they had fixed that issue, um, but I, I need to go through with a little bit of a fine tooth comb and find out what's going on. Uh, if there's a little bit of repetition in programs. Um uh, but in my particular case, it's a case of just bloatware. I got to okay. go in and, and get rid of uh, all that bloatware. Uh, however, my system's a little bit unique because it's custom built to my needs. And I have two uh, high capacity drives alongside that. Um, so I use uh, I use a a smaller solid state drive for my operating system and then for all my data i have two optical drives that are higher capacity and uh actually if you see that you'll you'll see that my higher capacity drives this one's barely barely touch and that's a four terabyte drive and then this one's a six terabyte drive, and that's about a third of the way, okay? This one's about a fifth of the way. So I have plenty of room on my computer, all right? It's just that uh, operating system drive is starting to uh, max out. And that is going to very much create problems for my system, uh, possibly slowing things down. So I got to address it, all right? But if you find that you store your images, you know, because, you know, most, most computers are built with one drive, all right? And they use, they're usually a high capacity drive, okay? If you're in that situation, then you need to go through and clear out all your old work, okay? And find a drive system that hopefully you can move the files to the drive system, but still maintain the library link in Lightroom. So that way you can access the, the images on your uh, uh, backup drive through Lightroom without having to you know, rebuild catalogs and, and open up uh, uh, alternate catalogs and that good stuff, or losing all the work that you've done because you just moved the files and nothing else okay so um that creates a little bit of a challenge okay so uh like in my case uh what i do is at home i have a network drive that operates as a second drive but it's actually over wi-fi okay so uh and, and I'm trying to establish that here. I just have to, you know, set some time to do it. But what that allows me to do is in Lightroom, okay, 
I will see my main drive that I keep all my files on. And again, again, why am I, why am I holding up my hand? I have this nice drawing surface. All right. Uh, I have my computer here. Okay. So this is my main computer. All right. And then I have a backup drive. All right. So Lightroom is installed on my main drive. Okay. And this is the uh, catalog, the, um, uh, the photos. All right. And all my previews. Okay. All right. And Alan, I, I was going to get a little bit deeper into this with you after you figure it out, but we're going to be touching on some of it here. So just keep this in the back of your head um, uh, okay. for your issue. Okay. So all this is a lot of data that is being held. Okay. And obviously the more images you have, the larger all of these things get okay obviously uh this is going to be in the terabytes uh, because photos take up a lot of space okay catalog not so much okay because this is just an address book okay and then your previews that's going to be you know uh, uh, fairly sizable because they are JPEG renditions of your main files. Okay. So this can get uh, bloated. This can get bloated with, you know, the more photos that you add to your catalog. Okay. So what do we need to do in order to uh, bring down the storage you know, we got a full storage. In order to bring that down, we have to now move files from the main drive to your backup. Okay. Now, the catalog, okay, your catalog is going to stay on your main drive. Okay. That's the easiest way to do it, all right? And I always tell people is whatever photos you are currently working on, your working images, you want those on your main drive because your main drive has the easiest, fastest access to that data, all right? Otherwise, it has to go through cables or it has to go through Wi-Fi or however you got your backup connected, okay? And here's the problem that I'm going to touch on. The previews can get very bloated, but there's a way of reducing the previews, all right? Now, Photoshop, or I'm sorry, Lightroom has... Uh, uh, three, three methods of creating previews. All right, one is minimal. All right, means it's 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 very small, not quite a thumbnail, but it's a small size, maybe half a megapixel, one megapixel image. So it's 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 low. Okay. Uh, and it's usually what you will see in the grid display. All right. That's what's used to populate your, your grid when you see your collection in a grid. Okay. When you go to the edit mode or when you go to the full screen mode on an image, it's going to display a standard image. Okay. All right. Uh, then when you go to your develop module, okay, the develop module, uh, it's going to create a full res preview. So if you have a five megapixel uh, raw file, it's going to create a five megapixel JPEG. 
Okay, so now you can see how that can get very cumbersome. Now, this is a setting you can set within uh, Lightroom when it initially imports it. Okay, and I usually tell people go ahead and set it to standard because that's the easiest one to work with without overly affecting the um, uh, uh, the um, ah, mental block uh, the performance of Lightroom. Okay, so what happens is you have a standard a standard uh, um, preview when you go into the uh, develop module it temporarily creates a full res while you're there all right that's why you can zoom in and and you know uh, get very granular with your edits all right and then when you're done editing and you go back into your uh, uh, grid mode and you move on to another image it dumps that full res all right but it's it take it keeps that standard all right so if you have a slower machine you may notice that there is a delay as it loads to preview in the develop module okay so if you notice that kind of delay this is the reason okay so what some people suggest is if you don't want that delay when you import images import them as a full resolution preview all right so what's going to happen is in the uh, library module it's going to down res them very easily okay but when it goes into the develop module it's already at full res you can go straight to work you can do all your zooming in because it doesn't need to up res uh, your standard uh, preview okay so here's the problem if you are importing at full res you are creating full resolution JPEG files that are being placed in a folder in your main drive all right that you're storing all your images in okay that's where the bloat comes in okay now fortunately there's a way of telling uh, Lightroom hey I want you to go through my entire library dump all these full res images or uh, previews and just build standard or just build minimal okay I usually say just build minimal okay uh, but in order to avoid that, I normally tell people, don't do the full res unless you are noticing a very distinct, uh, uh, you know, delay that is very annoying to you and slows your work process. Don't use the full res. Standard uh, previews is good enough. Okay. But... If you are going to move your files, your older files, from your main drive to your backup drive, what I normally suggest is if you are on standard here, as you move, all right, just go to minimal on your, on your backup drive. Why? Because most of the, the files that come into here you you've done you've worked on them all right you're just kind of keeping them for posterity's sake in case you want to revisit them okay you don't need those large previews because those previews are not being stored here those previews are still here all right so if we can reduce the file size here all right it's going to save you some room Okay. If right. I store them in minimal and then want to bring them back to the main computer, can I re can I get my full residual back? Yes, you can 
yes, you have the ability to tell Lightroom to uh, generate, you know, standard or full size. All right. But just okay. realize if you are storing in minimal, okay, Lightroom is automatically going to uh, uh, regenerate the previews it needs when it's in the library mode or in the develop mode uh, without your input, okay? It's just, mm -hmm. it's going to take the computer that little bit of time in order to regenerate those files, okay? And then once you're done with it, it dumps it, okay? Because uh, uh, Lightroom's going to operate with what you told it to operate with, whether it's minimal, standard, or full rents, all right? So I, I usually, like I, I said, I usually tell people standard is good. It's small enough that it's not that big a deal, all right? Uh, and um, uh, oftentimes, while it's building the full res, I'm working off that standard, and the standard is good enough to get me started in my editing while in the background it's regenerating that full res preview. Okay? So that's why sometimes when you go from, from your gallery view to your edit screen, you'll notice that the, the image is pixelated at first. And it takes a little while before that clarity kicks in. That's because it's generating that full res image. Okay. Yep, I noticed that. Yes. Yes. All right. So so now we can utilize that to save us some room. Okay. So if you have old files that you're no longer actively working on, reduce them down to minimals. All right. Because the previews are going to remain on your main drive, while the raw files are going to be moved to the backup drive. Okay. So that's one, that's method number one. Okay. And this, this is pretty much what I do because it's easy. It's the easiest. All you have to do is click and drag from your main drive into your backup drive right here in your folders view. Okay. Just click and drag and it's going to move the raw files and it's going to update the catalog to say, Hey, you know, uh, I am moving these to here, all right? And then at that point, you can go ahead and um, uh, highlight the, the files and then tell Lightroom to go ahead and uh, render minimal um, uh, render minimal previews, okay? I haven't done it in a while, uh, so I don't think I can readily do it off the top of my head, okay? Um, but there is a way of doing it and I can get back to you, uh, or if you want, uh, reach out to me, say, this is what I want to do. Um, and, uh, uh, I will look it up and walk you through it. Okay. But Thank I know you. it Thank is you. possible. All right. Now here is the other thing I would suggest with that with that setup, okay? Take the time to go back over your old catalog uh, images, your your old images, you know, maybe two, two years or older, and get rid of all the images that you don't need, okay? And you know you have them, okay? Uh, hopefully at that point, you have your keepers, you know, the ones that, you know, are, are those are the go-to images, all right? The other ones are just duplicates that are hanging on for dear life that, that you don't need, okay? So you can go through and clear out, okay? Um, if you are not that brave, you know, uh, at this point, you have gotten a lot better with your photography, your composition stronger, your editing stronger, your ability to control your exposure is better. And you're going to look at some of these old photos and you're going to say, all right, I have six of the same scene. Out of those six, I edited one 
because that was the best I had at the time. The others I just held on for posterity's sake. All right. But now that I'm looking at them with my advanced photographic skill set of eyes, <laughs> I can see all oh, these three right here. Oh, my God. I don't believe I actually took those. Delete them. Get rid of them. You don't need them because if you do some deep down soul searching, you know you're not going to edit those. Okay, so why have them taking up room on your system? Considering uh, you have them to um, Lightroom, right? What's that? Otherwise, I mean, as opposed to going to Explorer and and deleting them. Uh, yeah, do it in Lightroom. Delete them through Lightroom. Do it in Lightroom because you can see you can, you know, you can uh, you, you can see multiples at a time. All you know, right, use the survey function. OK, isolate the six on, on their own and say, OK, I'm keeping these three. I'm getting rid of those three. All right. And hit the delete key. All right. Before you when you hit the delete key, it's going to give you a little pop up. Make sure you read that pop up first. All right. Because it's very easy to delete images that are selected that you didn't realize were selected. So be careful. OK. All right. Now. Like I said, that's the easy, easy method. All right. Here is a more complex method, but it's going to free up your system a lot more. OK, so we have the same scenario where we have our uh, computer. All right. This is our main computer. OK, and then we have our backup. OK. Our library, all right, is here. So we have our catalog, our photos, and our previews. Okay. And this catalog uh, is, you know, your, your main catalog. Okay. Uh, whatever it's called, you know, Lightroom. V13.5, whatever, whatever Lightroom has assigned it. Okay. Um, and you say, okay, I have 5,000 photos in that catalog. I have 5,000 photos sitting on my main drive that are taking up a lot of room. And I have 5,000 previews that is just, it's flatlining my poor computer. Okay. I have myself a nice little backup. I need to remove some of this, get it onto my backup. All right. So we already went through method number one. This is method number two. Okay. You're going to go folder by folder or month by month or year by year. Okay. However you want to do this. All right. But in essence, you are going to create a second catalog. All right. All right. So let's let's do it. Uh, probably the most complex. I'll explain the most complex method. OK. But uh, you'll be able to kind of distill some slightly uh, simpler ways from that example. Okay. So we have, you know, uh, 2018, 2019, 2020, et cetera, all the way to present 2024. Okay. And you say, okay, I'm going to take my 2018 folder. So all the images in my 2018 folder is now going to get exported as a catalog. Okay. Exported. Export as. Export as catalog. Oh, I can spell. Export as catalog. Okay. And when you export it, you want to dump it into your backup drive. Okay. 
So now what it's going to do is anything that is labeled 2018 from here, it's going to take all those edits, okay, all those edits that you made, all the previews, all the instructions, all the everything that you did in Lightroom to all those files in your 2018, it's going to now put them here. All the photos and all the previews. All right. But it's going to name, all right, uh, actually, this is your main catalog. Okay. It's going to put it into a catalog called 2018 or whatever you want to, whatever you want to name it. Obviously, name it something that makes sense. Okay. So 2018, that's your, that's your new catalog. Okay. New catalog with all the photos, all the previews. All right. And during this export, you can say, make my previews minimal. Okay. Ah. Damn it. What the heck is this? All right. Make your, your previews minimal. Okay. Main backup. Okay. So it's going to export as catalog. All right. Now the problem is, all right, Lightroom is here. All right. It's going to create that 2018 catalog photos and previews. All right. This one has all your catalog photos and previews. <coughs> okay. Now, what that has done is it created a copy. All right. It exported a copy. All right. So now you have, all right, we, we established we have 2018, 2019, all the way to 2024. Okay. 2018 is still here. It is also now here. Okay. Uh, which is great if that's what you want, but we are trying to reduce the load on our main machine. What you need to do is you need to close out of your main catalog, mm. open up this 2018 catalog, double check it, make sure everything transferred properly. Okay. Like I said, this is a little bit tedious. All right. But I suggest don't put your faith on it. More than likely, it did the transfer well. It 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 survived going across, but I like to play on the safe side. All right, go to your backup drive, open up that catalog, and all you will see is just your 2018 photos. Okay. All right. Once you know that these are okay. You're going to come back here and you're going to delete. You're going to delete your 2018. Right. Uh, okay. All right. I no. have, I, now I, I have, a, I, I, I don't want to interrupt, but I, I have, I have to ask you this now. Now in Lightroom, Lightroom Classic and in Photoshop, when I open these up, do, do I have the same photographs from the same area or does each program have its own photographs of the same photograph? Uh, it's uh, both programs pull from one source. Okay. All that, right. So wherever, so, so wherever have... your, your folder is, that's where it's pulling that information from. Okay, good. Okay. We'll, we'll drop it right there. Thank yeah. You. Yeah. So they're not going to duplicate anything. All right. Okay. Good. So now you did 2018, you're going to go ahead and do 2019, 2020, 2021, 2022. And you might want to say to yourself, I'm going to keep 2023 and 2024 because 
well, we're still in 2024. That's my recent one. And I want to be able to go back one year without having to open up a new catalog. Okay. So now what's going to happen is on your backup, you're going to have one catalog for 2018, one catalog for 2019 with uh, your catalog, your photos, your previews. Oh, that should be a nine. 2020, we'll have a catalog, photos, previews. 2021, we'll have your catalog, photos, and previews. So where the hassle becomes is now if you need to, say, look at photos from 2019, you have to close this catalog and open this one. Okay? That can be a bit of a pain. That's why I prefer method number one, all right? But it's going to keep everything on your main drive except the photos. These are going to be shared, okay? All right, you're going to be removing those, okay? So it depends on how much room you're trying to make on your system and how much access you need to your back catalog. Okay. All right. The other thing is you can do is you can just do a master. Uh, uh, instead of doing individual by year, you can just do one master, you know, main number two here, and then just import all those and keep adding to that catalog. Okay. So you can export to a catalog that's existing as well, all right? So in that case, you know, uh, you're not opening multiple by year. You're just opening, you're closing the main one and opening the new one, all right? So you can see how you can distill down from what I covered previously. Same exact process, except you're creating bigger chunks of data instead of individual by year, okay? So it's the same process. And then you have to go back to your main computer, all right, and make sure that you delete everything that got moved over, okay? But double check first before you do any deletion. There are apps that uh, will eliminate duplicate photographs. Is that safe? Uh, okay, good question. All right, let's let's think about how these programs operate, okay? If they are operating off your metadata, which usually that's the, that's the way they are, okay? Then uh, they are fairly safe. What they normally do, the way they operate, is they they search through your drives. And uh, you can usually give them parameters. So, uh, for example, you can say, uh, look for raw files only. Okay. So it's going to go through all the raw files. And as you know, file names get reused. Mm -hmm. You can only go up to 9,999 before it flips. Okay. So in my system, I have file number image underscore one, two, three, four, probably, I don't know, five, six times on my system. Okay. So it says, well, if it's just operating off of the file name, you know, uh, that's no good. Okay. Uh, but fortunately, there's additional metadata that I can search for. All right, so it says, okay, I found these five five images here, okay? This one's called one, two, three, four. This one's called one, two, three, four. This one's called one, two, three, four. And this one is called one, two, three, four, all right? But this one has uh, a date of 1219. This one has a date of 320. This one has a date of 522. And this one has a date of 824. Okay. 
Uh, and there's other, you know, data, all right? Times are different. Uh, maybe the, um, the settings, all right, are different. So it looks for those. If everything is the same, then it, it knows it's the same file, okay? So it says, okay, uh, these are four individual files, all right? But if it looks in another one, it says, oh, here's a one, two, three, four, uh, taken on 12, 19. It's got the same time. It's got the same settings. But this one is on your C drive, and this is on your D drive, all right? Duplicate. Here we have a duplicate. And then it's going to ask you, which one do you want to delete? All right. So now you have to do a little bit of detective work. All right. Unless you, and this is where, you know, having a very systematic workflow comes into place. Okay. Mm -hmm. If you don't have a systematic workflow, you come across this example and say, well, I don't know which one is in my my uh, Lightroom catalog. I don't want to delete the wrong one. Okay, so you may need to go into Lightroom and say, okay, which one of these two is in my catalog? Okay, it could be they're both in your catalog. All right, but in that case, I do believe Lightroom has a a scan that you can scan for duplicates. Okay, uh, so you can use Lightroom to scan your catalog, but it only it only scans the catalog. It does not scan your system, unlike other programs. Okay, so this secondary program that you're using, it's finding that it's got you know two duplicates. One of these is in Lightroom, the other one is not. Okay, you need to discover which one it's which, and then you just get rid of the one that is not in your Lightroom catalog. Make sense? Yes. Okay. Now, this is where uh, these programs come into play uh, that makes it a little bit nicer. Okay. So we have one, two, three, four. Okay. Uh, taken on 12, uh, 19. Okay. And then you have home taken on 12, 19. All right, one, two, three, four, three, twenty, and one, two, three, four, taken uh, eight, twenty-three, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, this one was taken at uh, uh, ten a.m. This one was taken at ten a.m. All right, uh, it was taken uh, with you know your your Olympus. Okay, same as this one uh, with a 2470, same as this one. All right, so it, it notices that all of this is the same except this. Okay, so it says, well, these have to be the same file. It's just one was renamed to something else because everything else, all this other metadata, is the same okay and most of these when they flag it they do build a little preview so that you can see and double check and then you can just say okay well we'll get rid of that one okay all right so that's why those programs are good because it doesn't you know it it, it looks for more than just a straight one-to-one -one relationship okay it, it looks for anything that is user modifiable, okay? Uh, it will look for, okay? Now, here's, here's where those also come in handy, all right? Within Lightroom, you know, let's say uh, you have a file that says 8 a.m., okay? And let's say this was taken on 320, okay? Uh, but this one says 10 a.m., all right? They're both the same file, okay? But uh, somehow a duplicate got made, and you notice that the time was wrong. The time should have said 10 a.m., all right? Uh, 
and you changed it. So this used to be originally used to be 8 a.m. but got changed to 10 a.m. All right, but all the other information is the same. All right, that system is going to notice this and flag it. All right. And it says, so because this is something that is user modifiable, just like the names are, okay? This is user modifiable. Any user, more, user you, bleh, I can talk. Any user modifiable EXIF information that can be changed, if it's different, it's going to notice that it's different because it's also looking up the non-modifiable information data that's embedded, okay? So if that non-modifiable information is the same, it's going to realize that these two are the same file and it's gonna flag it. Does that make sense? Yes, it is. Okay, all right. And then at that point, it'll show it to you and then you can say, all right, I'm going to get rid of that, okay? All right, but it takes, it. it it's what I call monkey work, all right? Uh, you don't want to do it. You don't want this, the program to automatically delete anything without you checking it first, okay? <laughs> That's my warning, all right? So, all right, good question. All right, Any anybody else? So to put a pin in my original question, then, or my situation is I've got a, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, I've got a laptop with about 950 gigabytes, I guess. Yep. Um, and since I started shooting raw, you know, I know I'm going to start running out of space because that's where I keep everything. Right. And so, <clears throat> and I have two zip drives that I, you know, external SSD drives that I plug in and back up things too. Correct. So I can, sounds like I can just use one of those and designate a folder on that as my backup and yeah. move things over there. Yeah. And uh, Lightroom will know about it when it's plugged in. That, um, that yeah. So, so yeah. what you get, actually, I, I have that because um, I have these. Version number one. Yeah. Basically. So so this is what you're seeing here is my entire my entire catalog, all right? And uh you'll notice let me let me scroll up, okay? You'll notice that my my main drive, my C drive is not listed here. Okay? Because like I mentioned earlier, I do not keep any photos on my C drive. My C right. drive is reserved for my operating system only. Okay. So I have images in my um, one of these two storage drives. Now these two storage drives are on my machine. They're, they are drives built into my machine. They're not external. They're internal drives, okay? Because I had this machine custom built for me, okay? But before I got this machine, my older machine didn't have that luxury. So I had to put files somewhere. So what I did is, do I have my drive here? No, I think I... I, I, I I have it elsewhere. So what I did is I had a little external drive that used um, that used let me see that used uh, these small disks, uh, small optical drives, the uh, notebook drives. Okay, and it was a redundant uh, mirroring system. Okay. So, so each backup requires each backup requires two dri two disk drives. Okay, so that was my old system falling apart here. Okay, 
So what I would do is I would uh, export to these external drives and you can see I have them uh, labeled uh labeled disk one disk two disk three okay because i have i have three sets number number one number two and number three okay but they are all linked to my main library all right so if we open up this number one, you can see it goes all the way back to 2006. All right, so I have two, 2006, 2008, 2009, 2010. Don't ask me what happened to 2007. All right, 2006 and 2007, I was working with a little Kodak point and shoot, six megapixel digital camera. So, uh, but anyway, if we open those up and I go to my grid view, uh, you're gonna notice that there are no previews, all right? Because I dumped all the previews, all right? When I when I switched computers and I, I moved my library into this new one, all right? Uh, I dumped all the previews and because these were not plugged in, it never rebuilt the previews, okay? So for me, it's not a big deal because these drives are not currently plugged into my machine. So I have absolutely no access to any of these until I plug it in, all right? So that's why you're gonna see all of these are pretty much blank, okay? As a matter of fact, I don't think I have anything here that has um previews built for it okay um these do have previews all right because this disc three is the latest one and you can see it goes back to 2019 so it's fairly recent all right so uh more than likely i was accessing these discs from this new machine, so the library had a chance to build the previews, all right? And more than likely, these are all very minimal previews, okay? As you can see some of these aren't even built. It's actually missed a couple, okay? All right. Uh, so, yes, you can uh, uh, use your, your uh, external drives like that. Um, and as you can see, what I've done is, uh, through the operating system, I assigned these disks, even though they're all plugged into the same machine, I assigned these disks different, um, disk drives. Okay. So you can see I have I, J and X. All right. Uh, it was random. I I should it should have been I J K, but who knows? All right, um, or actually H I J. Okay, uh, I would suggest look into doing that because that will allow you to keep them separate within your catalog. All right, otherwise it gets very very complicated, and Lightroom's going to have a hard time. If you have uh, two drives, you know, um, plugged in, and this one says, you know, drive E, and this one says drive E, there's going to become a conflict. So when you plug this in, go into your operating system and assign it a, a letter. And I usually assign it something way down the line. All right. Uh, don't let it auto assign. Okay because if it auto assigns this as E, and then you unplug it, E is no longer now on your system. You plug in this one, and it says, oh, I'm gonna name that E. Guess what, your catalog is gonna be off, 
because it's looking for the images here because this is what E is supposed to be, but it's finding them here. All right, and it's not finding the same photos. All right, so if you have multiple uh, um, externals that you plug in and plug out, assign them a letter, all right, and make sure that they're different. Does that make sense to you, Bri? Oh, it makes sense because basically that was my career doing managing yeah, yeah, that kind yeah, of stuff. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> and actually what I was going to try something slick was in my own little manual mirroring, I was going to uh, do what you just suggested, put it on a external drive, but then I've got two external drives which are exactly the same. And so I was going to put one, like, copy the stuff over to the other one from time to time. And so... If it's plugged in, it'll see it, and then it'll yeah. So think when, it's there when it's when it's plugged in, okay. Uh, and I suggest you know uh, I always suggest make sure that you um, uh, always do it when you're plugged in because it's yeah. going to all right because this is your main drive or or your main yeah your main drive that's always going to be visible, all right. But because these are uh, plugins, plugin backup, all right, these are temporary. Okay. So that means they will only be visible uh, and accessible when you are plugged in. When you're not plugged in, all you have access to are the. Um, uh, the uh, the previews, you don't have access to the actual raw file any edits you do it's going to tell you it can't do the edits because it cannot find the um, source file okay now one way to get a, all right so you can say all right that's uh different drive letters if you don't want to do that the way to get around it is to just export all right, export as catalog. All right, and then you're going to give it a new name. All right, and now this becomes its own catalog. All right, so there will be no conflict between the two. All right, because in order to access these images, you have to close out this catalog and open the new one okay so there will be no conflict in that case all right uh, but it becomes bothersome because you have to close one out and open the other one all right uh, so what i would suggest is if you have a case all right get a sticker on it and write down what is on those or what I did is I created a uh, um, document file. Um, let's see if I can, oops. I created a document file on my Google Drive. Uh, I don't know where I put it, but I have, um, my Lightroom catalog uh, could be somewhere. Somewhere in here, I have a document file with everything that's on those drives, so I can always look them up um, mm. outside of <clears throat> of this. Okay, so you have several options. You just have to figure out which one makes better sense for you, for your system uh and for being able to have the images accessible you know so if you have you know <laughs> those images from 2006 i haven't opened up those in like i don't know eight years <laughs> yeah. uh so uh you know um do i do i need those accessible from from my catalog not really, you know. So you you just gotta make that decision for yourselves. Okay, make sense.
Makes sense. Thanks. Right. That's uh, just what I needed because, like I said, I'm mainly for me. I'm not that worried about the previews and the other stuff space, but just the size of the original raw files of uh, right. You know, someone who used to be a JPEG guy. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we <laughs> all know, started it's there. Just significantly different. Yeah. I, as a, I have never had this problem, and and I don't have that many photos to deal with. Just. And some of them are old, but I don't want to lose those. So yes. I just want to be able to get at them. And now that I've done work on them, yep. I don't want to lose it. So okay, you're well, right. Yeah, you, some you of those. Have are, a, I don't a, you have a couple of options that you can use for moving your files. Okay. So, and if you have any questions or run into any problems, you know how to get a hold of me. I'm a phone call away. <laughs> so. Awesome. Those are some awesome questions. Something that we haven't really talked about is uh, the, the catalogs uh, in Lightroom for a while. So that was good. Hopefully it's a refresher for some of you as well. So, all right. Uh, what time is it? It's almost 830. Uh, any final questions before we close out? No. No, that's it. Okay. All right. Uh, again, uh, hopefully, let's. Uh, hopefully, you'll join me on uh, the multiplicity photo shoot. Uh, and don't forget, uh, if you're interested in doing portrait work, uh, we got the uh, workshop coming up uh, in a couple of weeks, and Yale on Sunday. So, all right, guys. As always, I, say now, I won't be able to attend the uh, photo shoot this weekend. We have some family coming in from out of town, Aww. so I'll be entertaining. <laughs> all right. Uh, that's all right. My sweetie's daughter's coming into town, and so <laughs> the uh, whole world is moving more, to a yeah. Family's yeah. more yeah. important than I am. Okay. Yeah, more unless, important than I am. <laughs> unless you want to get them involved and do a multiplicity with them. <laughs> no. <laughs> It's also right. my sweetie's hey. birthday on Friday, so it's a big, oh. uh, big deal. So, happy, tell, you know. tell her I say happy birthday then. All righty. Awesome. All right, guys. Thank you for sharing your time with me. As always, I hope you learned something. And mm -hmm. we will see you next month. Great. Take care. Thanks. All right. Take it. All right. Thank you. Take it easy. Good night. Thank you for watching Learning Photography with Duck. Brought to you in association with Milford Photo, your local full-service camera store. Located in downtown Milford, Connecticut, Milford Photo offers you a personalized shopping experience. From the latest camera gear to printing and framing services. And, of course, educational workshops to teach you the finer aspects of photography. Don't forget to tell them Duck sent you.